Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. My guest today has been drawing urbane, irreverent cartoons for The New Yorker and every other magazine that would have him for the past 50 years. Cartoons with attitude, steeped in his Brooklyn roots, like this one. What are you, crazy? We got tickets to the producers tomorrow night. Yeah, meet Mort Gerberg, cartoonist, but much more. He's also a reporter who brought satiric wit to his sketches on social justice, politics, and women's rights long before Me Too. His extraordinary career is captured in a retrospective called Mort Gerberg on the Scene, now on exhibit at the New York Historical Society. Mort and Me, next. It's delightful to see you again, old friend. It's wonderful seeing you. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. You know, I was thinking about a quote from Yogi Berra, uh, who said most of the things that are attributed to him, not all of them, but one of the things that's attributed to Yogi is, you can observe a lot just by watching. <laughs> and it seems to me that's a summary of your career. You watched, you observed a lot, and you drew it. Well, <clears throat> actually, it's a sort of an interesting thing. A couple of years ago when I was doing um, a talk, uh, actually it was up in New England someplace, like one of those islands that was on, and it came to me that a cartoonist uh, and probably a reporter, even like yourself, uh, is like an oyster because... Uh, or small with a hard shell? No, no. Yeah, the, the regular <laughs> oyster thing, you know, because the oyster <laughs> is a... Is a, is a person, a person yes, is a thing, okay. it's, a, it's there, and a piece of sand comes along, it gets under the shell and irritates it. Right. And what comes it out stimulate. is a, a pearl. It irritates and stimulates. It makes a pearl. Yeah. And a cartoonist walks around and watches and sees things, and something yutzes it, something bothers him, and what comes out is a pearl of wisdom in the form of a cartoon. What yes, do, and you've think? had many pearls. So throughout. I think Yogi was right in a certain way. He, had a, a <laughs> he was right about many things. Many things. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what's f f fun for me and thrilling for me about you is that you're still doing it today with the same enthusiasm from 50 years ago. Well, I how mean, do you do that? I, it's nothing that I elected to do. I think, uh, as my as Judith, my wife would say, I mean, it's something I had some sort of an X factor. It was some kind of a DNA thing that made me react to things. That's all. And I do a lot of hollering and screaming, <laughs> which is not necessarily productive. <laughs> but this is an outlet of reacting to something around. And I, I found myself very fortunate. I kind of like blessed because I always like to draw a little bit, and I always like to shoot my mouth off about something or other. So this right. is a kind of a, a blending in a certain way that doesn't really hurt anybody unless they're very thin-skinned, or I have to direct something. But truly, it's, it's something that I just do without thinking about what, what you know, like I wanted to yeah, do this. Sure. I actually tried to avoid doing this because this was not going to be a career that was going to go any place to make me $100 million. So it was just something that I have been very fortunate to be able to continue to do, uh, even though I'm not really working. This is what I do. That's this is all. what you do. And we're, we're, we're the better for it, well, the fact that you do it. Uh, let, me make, let me make a quick correction here. The name of the book that goes with the exhibit at the uh, New York Historical Society is Mort Gerberg on the Scene. I said that was also the name of the exhibit, but that's, I was wrong. The name of the exhibit? Mort Gerberg Cartoons, A New Yorker's Perspective. Okay. You are a New Yorker. You're from Brooklyn, as I mentioned, of course, before. Yes. And uh, we're going to get to more of your... Well, why don't we do it now? Let's get to some more of his Brooklyn Attitude uh, uh, cartoons. There was, there was one I loved of a woman uh, sitting at dinner in a restaurant, and the waiter is taking her order, and, you know, he's asked her what she would like, 
And she says, or do you remember? No, that's not a woman. That's a man in a Chinese restaurant. That's a man. Okay. Can and tell that, what I know. <laughs> that's a New Yorker cartoon. Yes. And the guy is saying, what I'd like is different presidential candidates, but what I'll have is the shrimp with garlic sauce. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, another one that I love is Castaway Island. Oh yeah, that's one of my great favorites. I did that a few years ago when I was realizing that all of my favorite things truly were becoming obsolete, like telephone booths, mailboxes. I mean, you can't find a mailbox anymore. No. Telephone booths, long gone. I mean, Victrolas. <laughs> right. You know. Yeah. Whoever heard of the word Victrola? Victrola, right. Yeah. Or, you know, t dial telephones, you know, stuff mm -hmm. like that. And so I pictured them, you know, on this island that people would be, including this castaway, you know, the cliche, sure. of all the, the cartoon cliches, the castaway island, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. As one with political sensibility uh, from 20 years ago, that is still uh, as uh, topical today as then. It's a, it's uh, it's St. Peter at the gate with the book, and the man is coming up and he's being questioned, and he's saying to St. Peter, "Wait, those weren't lies. That was spin." Right. That was spin. I think that was, uh, yeah, I forget which administration that was, but it's all, you know, the same. And today, more than ever. Oh, I mean, sure. My God, that, that, that unmentioned person there, unmentionable name. Yeah. I think he did a job the, the other the, night. Yeah. The guy in Washington. Yeah. Yes, right. Okay. Well, um, I said at the beginning that Mort is much more than a, than a single panel cartoonist, even though his cartoons have been in... Esquire and Playboy and The New Yorker and the Saturday Evening Post and every place else that ran cartoons. And the book is called On the Scene. So let's talk about some of the scenes you were on. Imagine being a reporter and a fellow with a sketch pad at the 1968 Democratic Convention. Let's talk about that. How did that happen? What did you do? Well, um, first of all, uh, to go back to the oyster, uh, I mean, I was really, you know, in the middle of all of that feelings of protest. This is 60, 67, 60, 66, 67, Seven. going to the, you know, the, the uh, convention in, in, in Chicago, leading up to that, getting new changes perhaps, and protests, the Vietnam War was really heavy. And uh, I just went up to Norman Cousins at the Saturday Review, and I said, I'd like to do something like that. I'd been doing a lot of cartoons at the Saturday Review. I said, Norman, as I would often do uh, with editors, I would go with an idea. We'd call right. it pitching things. And in those days, you could go one-on-one. -on -one. Norman, I'd like to do two pages. And he'd say, fine, you'd go. And that would be the thing. I got press credentials, just four days of sketching, day and night, and writing things down, just all of these impressions that I had collected. Uh, and the instantaneousness of the sketches and the notes that I made were probably untouched for what I picked then to use in this spread. It became a big spread in, in I think it was Cavalier or Escapade magazine. Mm -hmm. it did two pages and then the Saturday Review used a couple of the sketches too. Uh, and it truly was phenomenal of being, you know, face to face with all of this, these raw emotions. I mean, and, and of course, this is also a very long time good friend of mine, Paul Krasner, who was Smart. part of the uh, Chicago seven to eight, nine, whatever they were, Abby Hoffman and all, Jerry Rubin. And the whole thing was, you know, the fulcrum of all of it. Wasn't Krasner your first, in effect, editor? I mean, he was. You did cartoons for the, he had a magazine Realist. called The Realist. The Realist, yeah. Paul and I uh, bonded very quickly. I had restarted my life when I had gone to Mexico in 1960, uh, kicking the so-called nine to five life and maybe trying out doing a lot of drawings down in Mexico for about a year and sending stuff back. Then I got back to New York in about 61 and met Paul and uh, or maybe I had been him before, I don't remember, and just started doing stuff for the realists, which is really outrageous stuff. And, uh, but again, we remained friends even to this day uh, about changing things. He was a person that, you know, was, he would say, you can't make this stuff up, you know, when you see headlines, right. 
like today. You can't, can't make no. this stuff up. No. So he was the original person for that, but he was very important in Chicago as well. And uh, I went around for those four days drawing the stuff, and it was just huge uh, as, yeah. And uh, including, uh, Neil and I had been staying at the Hilton Hotel, and I had come back one night to try to get into the hotel, and uh, there was this definite aroma. It wasn't... <laughs> It wasn't matter what. It was tear gas. It was. Oh, tear, really? I thought you. Oh, were, no, 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 no. Yeah. Tear gas. Say, that's different. That's a different story. The 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 protesters had tear gassed the hotel, and the hotel was surrounded by cops on horseback and things like that. And here I was, and I came with my. I thought I was such a big deal, you know. I had press credentials to get into the convention. I couldn't imagine. I was doing this, me, you know, a little stippy from Brooklyn on the thing. And the cops are there, and they're doing it. And I said, I'm going into the hotel. And he said, No, you can't go in there. I said, I have a room there. I can live there. He said, You can't get in there. And I, I hold up this thing like the national, not the amulet is going to have me. And he <laughs> press, press. And he swerves the horse, and I got knocked down by the horse. You're lucky you didn't, from what I've read about the cops in Chicago in 68, you're lucky you didn't get a baton in the face. Well, that too. I, I, I think Paul got hit a few times. I mean, f- it was very, you know, it was very tough. But a, a footnote, as we're talking about such a successful career, I just love this story. You, you, you didn't succeed early. Your early work wasn't thought to be good, and you never broke through at your high school newspaper because they already had a cartoonist whose name was? Maurice Sendak. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, it was... Think about a high school that has Sendak as the cartoonist for the newspaper. Well, yeah, when I got in there, I said, I, I thought I would like to draw cartoons, and this, this strip was, wonder- was just, just a wonderful. Uh, drawing, I said, oh my God, I could never do anything like that. And that's sort of like the way it, you know, it went on. It was, um, uh, the strip is called Pinky Card. And uh, it was about this kid who would get what they would give out these detention or demerit slips yeah. if he did something yeah. bad. And so Pinky Card would be getting these things. And finally, after three years, you know, this strip disappeared because the guy had, had uh, graduated. And then years later, I forgot exactly how it came about, but I found out that it was this guy named Maurice Sendak, whom I had never met. I didn't want to know from him. However, uh, then those, you flash forward maybe 15, 20 years, I forget whenever it was, and I started to sell a little bit. And uh, I was very friendly with Bob Blackman, the legendary uh, artist and animator. And he said, I'm going to go out and see this um, show, uh, this exhibition or signing that Maurice Sendak is doing. I said, Maurice Sendak, wow, I, I would like to meet him. And he said, well, he's a good friend of mine. You want to come along? And I said, I would be delighted to. So we go to the signing, and here's Maurice sitting there, and he's doing this whole thing. And we come up, and Bob says, uh, Maurice, I'd like you to meet um, Mort Gerberg. You know, he's just starting out. I think Maurice either knew or he was being polite. He said, oh, yeah, I think I say I know your work. And I said, well, Morris, it's delightful meeting you after all these years. By the way, whatever happened to that character you used to use called <laughs> Pinky Card? You know, went like this. <laughs> what? How'd what? You? So, but yeah, yeah it, was, it was quite, quite unusual. But. I'm talking to the multi-talented uh, Mort Gerberg old friend about his uh, retrospective now on at the New York Historical Society, which you can go see and you should go see it. 68th and uh, Central Park West. The New- you know where the New York is. 77th Street. 77th and, uh, yeah, well, okay. The New York Historical Society, retrospective on Mort, on the scene. Uh, the Mets, you, you, you didn't confine yourself to politics. You, you did sports. And the Mets in Atlanta one year for, was it Life Magazine? Life Magazine. That was absolutely so. This isn't one of these things, these, these Meshuggah crazy ideas that you go up to somebody and say, how about this? And that was, I think, a light motif for all of the stuff that I did. I would think of this idea and say, well, how about doing this? And I said, well, nobody ever did that before. And I said, well... Why not ask? So who did you go up to and say, I how about this? I don't remember how, I, uh, how it kind of like worked out. It was probably, as often happens, it's a friend of a friend, to go see this one, go see that one. I mean, even if we talk about my getting to NBC, you know, to do stuff that we did all those years ago, it was also through Dick Schapp. But that's another story. Yeah. But this, this was a case of meeting somebody 
Bill McWhorter was the editor's name, and I had pitched him on an idea of doing a satire on uh, baseball, which was the most, you know, hallowed subject. You know, I thought, well, we'll make fun of baseball. And he and other people said, yeah, I guess we can, you know, let's, let's do that. I said, all right, we'll do that in the fall, because I'd just gotten married to Judith, and we were going to go off on a vacation or a honeymoon, whatever it is. Got back to New York City um, in September, and uh, I got, it was on a Monday, and the phone rang, and it was Bill McWhorter, and he said, Mort, that's, that spread, that, that satire we were going to do on baseball, we can't do it. And I said, oh. He said, well, wait a second, but what's going to happen? What we'd like you to do is to go to Atlanta this weekend because the Mets are having their playoff. And that's how that happened. Right. And I got Judith to come down with me, and she goes, oh, <laughs> Life Magazine and this great wisdom. They needed a photographer to go along with me. So they got this guy, Olsen, who, from no Norway. He'd never seen a baseball game in his life. <laughs> why and do they need a photographer? Why, You're why, drawing why. And they get him, well, they needed, you know, to go. And they got him off an ice, they had just done a story about an icebreaker in, in, in <laughs> Canada. And the guy comes down, maybe he was still wearing his, his, his parka, who knows, in, in Atlanta. Uh, and I had to go around with him to the park, say, over here is the field, point the camera this way. And she, <laughs> so I was doing that. I managed to get Judas stuck in, uh, st sitting in the press box, which I don't know if you remember that. It was a big superstition. Women could never be involved in a sports yes, press box. Yes, of course. And Bad luck, Judas supposedly. She, she took notes because her father, Maury, was always a big Mets fan. She knew baseball. She took the notes, and I did the drawings. Two and a half days of total, total... Writing, drawing, writing, drawing, writing, drawing, drawing. And it came out, it got through. And I'll never forget, you know, period, somebody's going to make a decision. What was his name? Graves uh, was the uh, managing editor, Ralph Graves, Robert Graves. And he, they would have... Life magazine, yeah. Life magazine. And they had, the way they did, they had all these multiple possibilities for these pages. And they were laid out on this big table. And Graves would walk down at the last minute and say, yes. No, yes, no. <laughs> and I'm standing there with McWhorter, who had let me in on this hallowed scene, you know, and we're watching him go, yes, no, two pages, three. This, originally the spread was going to be like six pages or something, or eight yeah. pages. And he came down and he stopped for a long time and he looked and finally he said, four pages. Four pages? Yeah. Wow. And it was unheard of. They, Life magazine had never done any kind of cartoons before. Uh, or any, I don't think since. Actually, the magazine folded a couple. Of <laughs> yeah, a few, a few days that ago. That was a harpoon in its... Yeah. That you know, everything we're talking about is on display at the uh, retrospective at the Historical Society. You need to go there and see it, Mort Gerberg's retrospective. There's so much to talk about, and time is fleeting. I am so... I was so stung in a, in a, in a, in a, in a beautiful way, in a, in a positive way, with your social commentary, some of it, and there's one that I think is remarkable for a number of reasons. One of them is that it was 1968 you drew this single panel cartoon. The second reason it's so uh, important, I think, is because it, it was in the Saturday Evening Post, which was a mass market magazine, and it's a cartoon of a black girl Dollhouse. Oh. Is that, look at this thing. Look at this. Take this in. Look at this. Talk us about that. Well, once again, uh, it was whatever the sense of right and wrong that was wrung for me uh, about the way uh, black people were being treated. This is only, you know, I was a young person in Brooklyn. What do I know? But my parents had taught me some things are right and some things are wrong. Again, this is 1968, this cartoon. And, and it's in Saturday Evening Post. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the dollhouse of the little girl playing it. And, and uh, I, I can't, it was just the way I responded to looking at things. Of course, cartoons uh, and any kind of comment is... Uh, looking at reality, at least for me, that's my definition of a cartoon. It right. means something. It spins off a reality that exists and then you twist it a little bit. 
And so I'm looking at this cliche, the most popular and, and ordinary of cliches, which is self-defining. A little girl playing in a dollhouse. How much more basic can you get? But up to that point, you, all you saw was little blonde girls. White girls. White girls that were playing with their dresses and all of their things are all very nicely done. And what about this other, right. other life? Yeah, it was something that just responded to me that was uh, in that way. I liked another one that was uh, in that show also. There are these three women, it's a sports car too, which I would like to say, I don't know if you remember seeing it, but these three black women, four black women are sitting in front of a yes. television. <laughs> yes. They're feeling, and they're watching this football game. And on the football game is this big guy and the proud mother is sitting in the chair there and she says, this is my son, the middle linebacker. <laughs> Which for me is a great wedding of the two, sure. the two cliches is the Jewish mother with my, my son, son the doctor. Yes. Exactly. And, but again, it's the drawing that I, I really, I mean, that's also a very important thing with, with drawings. Uh, that's why I was really so happy about the, the exhibition that, that shows the sketchbooks, these things that I did, like Chicago, like the, the Nick games that I was doing. The all Newport of, Folk Festival the sketchbook. Newport, right. Is I mean, it was all these drawings were done maybe in a minute, two minutes or something, and that was, that was it. And what's interesting is I look at these drawings today that I've been done 50 years ago, and they really come alive for me. I mean, they're I They're still be, current. They're, well, in many cases, they're still current. Well, they're, I mean, the, whatever you were satirizing or whatever you were trying to nail back then, often you look at these things, they're still well, and for me, they, I, I remember the moments that I was drawing them. That's what I'm saying. It's different yeah. from taking a photograph because this is much more visceral. And I remember sure. almost standing there. There was one I did in, in Yugoslavia in the harbor, uh, which is in the book also in, in the front. And Judith later on telling me that uh, I was surrounded by 23 little kids who were watching me draw. I never knew they were there. I must have been standing there for four or five minutes doing the drawing. And I remember that when I see the drawing. So, I mean, it's something about on-the-spot sketching like that. In, in, this, in, uh, in furtherance of the idea that, that a lot of Mort's work is, is still current, he's bringing out, everything old is new again. He's bringing out three old books oh, again. Oh, yeah, yeah. One of them is uh, Reagan World, your yeah. satire of... Well, this, yeah, this is, this is, a, well, this is 1981, I think, and obviously it's Reagan World, uh, dealing with the almost inhuman social uh, practices and laws as, as, as perpetrated and begun uh, by the, uh, let me just say the conservatives, the sure. Republican conservatives. It's even worse than this then. So it's well, the in there you have the social safety net jump. Pin the tail on the donkey. Yeah. Was in there. It was based on uh, Disneyland. Yeah, sure. And, and I had gone to Disneyland to do a spread for the Diners Club, which is one of my early two page spreads on subjects. And of course, they, it was very, you know, uh, white bread and very ordinary. But it was the form that they had done. Everything was so nice, so wonderful. so And I used that format including right. the writing in this thing. I love the writing that I did. It was in, in here as well uh, to, you know, make real sharp fun of it. It's, so that's coming out again, Reagan This World. is, uh, we're reprinting this, so this is going to be available. In, and what about these other ones? The two um, more coming out? This is the first one that I ever done. This was actually uh, uh, my women's rights things, which yeah. was really instigated by my meeting Judith and uh, this book, I think, is 71, and Judith and I got married in 69, and she was already into the women's movement. Gloria Steinem was going to write an introduction to this, but then she got really hot, and she couldn't, <laughs> but uh, she did, didn't do that. But it was uh, making fun of all, all of the um, uh, cliches, once again. This is current. Well, and this is called what? Right on. Right on. Sister. Right on, sister. And That's coming out again. This is What's the, the other one? And the other one, oh, this one is most, most, this is called the high society. Pot. Or, this is, this is what, more yeah. drawing about pot. Is there anything hotter well, than pot today? Wait, it And says, the controversies about the states that are legalizing well, it? Well, this is the whole thing. The high society, or what happened when the country finally went to pot. So it presupposes that it happened. When was this? This is uh, 80, uh, 71, I guess it was. And it was begun... Uh, from a reality that I did that was based 
on a cover story in Newsweek. And I, I had a, they wouldn't let, Newsweek wouldn't let me reproduce the cover, so I drew it, and you know, right. I got permission to redraw it. So it was based on the real in facts, the real beginnings of the uh, crushing of marijuana uh, movement by Nixon, a lot of stuff on Nixon. And when I looked at it, and we realized that what's going on today, here's my Nixon, who's reading all these things, <laughs> uh, yeah. having, uh, to do with the real, real movement that's going on today, it seems to me, like I said, wait, this sounds familiar, because this is like a script. Sure. But this is in 71. Yeah. Anyway, these are the books that are You're being redone seer. today because they You're are- You're a seer. I am a prescient, nice a word. Prescient. 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 Look it yes. up. Yeah. I will look it up. I, I think I was, anything to do with pressing a Yeah, it's yeah, fixing no, it nice. Of course not. Um, I got to wrap it up. I, I got to tell you, this man, uh, whom I've known for 40 years and love very much, we're going to pick out furniture later, um, it, Pink. What, uh, wrote what I think is the Ur text on cartooning called Cartooning the Art and the Business. He wrote that book. He taught cartooning at uh, Parsons. Uh, for 15 years. I don't know. I would love to have him do another show on what you taught these kids about how to, not only how to draw, but how to find humor. And that you know, in itself is a That's whole. another show. You'll have to come back. I will do indeed. Well, yeah, my, Mort Gerber. My pleasure to talk to you. Thank Good you. Good to see you, Mort. Thank and you. the um, exhibit, uh, the retrospective, is at the New York Historical Society now. Mort Gerber's career. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.